Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our condensed service. My name is David Thompson, pastor here at First Lutheran Church of Chickasha. We're excited that you're joining us. Let us begin. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor fallen sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and would be justly deserving of your temporal and eternal punishment. But in your love you convicted my heart, so that I am sorry for those sins, and sincerely repent of them. Now I pray for your infinite mercy, seeking your grace and forgiveness for the sake of your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his command, announce the grace of God unto all of you. Your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray the collect for this day. O merciful God, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for this Sunday is taken from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 26, verses 8 to 15. But as soon as Jeremiah finished telling all the people everything the Lord had commanded him to say, the priests, the prophets, and all the people seized him and said, You must die. Why do you prophesy in the Lord's name that this house will be like Shiloh and this city will be desolate and deserted? And all the people crowded around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the officials of Judah heard about these things, they went up from the royal palace to the house of the Lord and took their places at the entrance of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and all the people, This man should be sentenced to death because he has prophesied against the city. You have heard it with your own ears. Then Jeremiah said to all the officials and all the people, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and this city all the things you have heard. Now reform your ways and your actions and obey the Lord your God. Then the Lord will relent and not bring the disaster he has pronounced against you. As for me, I am in your hands. Do with me whatever you think is good and right. Be assured, however, that if you put me to death, you will bring the guilt of innocent blood on yourselves and on this city and on those who live in it. For in truth, the Lord has sent me to you to speak all these words in your hearing. Here ends the Old Testament reading. The gospel for this Sunday is taken from the gospel of St. Luke, chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. 
Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Here ends the gospel. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Many of this current generation are shocked, appalled, and frightened by the aggression of Russian President Vladimir Putin and his over-the-top threat of nuclear nightmare, unless the West just looks the other way. But I lived through a different time. My family was living in Pensacola, Florida. The days were October 16th through the 28th, 1962. If the dates don't ring a bell from your World History II classes, you should be screaming for your teacher to give you an emergency review. In those 13 days, a nuclear world war was averted. It's remembered as the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Soviet Union was shipping nuclear missiles to Cuba, only 90 miles from the U.S. coastline, about, I don't know, five, ten minutes from launch to my house. Soviet ships had every intention of breaching a U.S. naval blockade and delivering their deadly cargoes. An American reconnaissance plane was shot down over Cuba and a U.S. invasion force was ready to strike. The United States Secretary of Defense later said, I thought it was the last Saturday I would ever see. But through intense negotiations between John F. Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev, including a United States Navy prepared to sink Russian ships, pictures of the missile launch sites, and some very harsh words. The Soviet ships turned around. No nuclear missiles landed or launched. No World War III. Crisis averted. In our text for today, it's not about the Ukraine or Russia or NATO, but about God's people reaching a crisis point for their very survival as a nation. And God sends the prophet Jeremiah to speak some very harsh words. The question is, will they heed those words and the crisis be averted? Though many today are spiritually oblivious to its seriousness, we are ever on the brink of a crisis, one of nuclear proportions, one that also threatens our very survival. And the prophet's question is very relevant. 
Will God's word preached to us avert the crisis of our eternal disaster? Despising the preaching of God's word creates an eternal crisis, threatening desolation and damnation. God's people, the kingdom of Judah, had reached that point because they were rejecting the word of God and thus Yahweh himself. Through Jeremiah, God was accusing them of going after other gods, including lasciviousness and sexual sins that were part of that evil worship. They were turning their backs on Yahweh, who had redeemed them out of Egypt and brought them to the promised land. The great I Am was pronouncing desolation for Jerusalem and the temple. This house, he says, that's the temple, shall be like Shiloh. Well, what does that mean? 450 years before, Israel took the Ark of the Covenant from its place in Shiloh as a good luck charm to battle against the Philistines. You see, they thought they could use their religion, their God, for their own purposes. God allowed the Ark then to be captured and Shiloh to be destroyed because of Judah's sin and unrepentant idolizing of the temple, Jeremiah proclaimed that the temple in Jerusalem would be desolate, slain, laid to ruins, dried up, destroyed, taken away. People don't like their idols being taken away. They were hearing their judgment and they reacted with hate and murder. It's quite a remarkable scene. Jeremiah finishes preaching God's word and the priest and false prophets, they threatened to kill him. Even before a hostile crowd, Jeremiah speaks for Yahweh and calls them to repentance. If they repent, if they turn to the Lord, God will relent of the disaster he's pronounced upon them. But if they refuse, mm -mm, this is the moment of crisis either for peaceful resolution or catastrophe. From the time of Adam and Eve's fall into sin, the whole world teeters on the edge of a crisis of nuclear proportions. We are all headed toward eternal catast catastrophe in hell. We have not given up our gods. We worship our carnal desires and feelings. We put the highest priorities on things of plastic, glass, and steel. Yeah, we lie and cheat to win over others and have power and control. This is rebellion against God. And as we descend into this journey of Lent, while living as if there will always be a tomorrow, we know we are in a crisis. For the wages of sin is eternal death. We have sinned and done what is evil in Yahweh's sight. What a crisis! We're lost and condemned creatures. No negotiations or trying to do better can bring a peaceful resolution. But God in his mercy has offered one way out of this crisis. The living word made flesh intervenes in the crisis. When we spoke of Jeremiah being brought before the priests and prophets and all the people, did this not sound familiar? Could you not see and could you not hear the Pharisees and Sadducees, the scribes and chief priests and all the people scurrying to their places and bringing Jesus before Pilate and demanding his death? Jesus was speaking all that the Father had commanded him and the Father even instructed the people, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. God's gracious intervention is made for his active enemies. As Jesus said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to it. Many have been sent into the vineyard to preach repentance and salvation and have been killed. But now he sends his son, God in the flesh. This is the only way the crisis of our damnation could be averted. God himself must live the commandments perfectly in our place, take the punishment of our sins into his own flesh and shed his blood in payment for our sin and hell. Oh, what wondrous love is this that averts our crisis, huh? And we are told the answer 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Yes, the Lord relents of this epic crisis by shedding his innocent blood for you and me. On the cross, Jesus gathers his wayward children as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. On the cross, Jesus dies desolate as the Father forsakes him in our place and claims us as his own. On the cross, Jesus gifts us with our citizenship in heaven, even as we now await his blessed return to take us to heaven forever. On the cross, Jesus declares, it is finished. The debt is paid. Your sins are forgiven. The crisis is averted. For us, then, the crisis is averted when we believe the preached word that calls us to repentance and delivers to us the living word. It turned out, in the verses immediately after our text, cooler heads prevailed. Jeremiah wasn't killed. But 22 years later, Judah was dragged off into captivity in Babylon. The temple and Jerusalem, they were destroyed, just as Jeremiah had warned. Which means... The people had never really taken God's word to heart. And so Paul wrote to the Philippians in our epistle, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Stand firm. It means we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Whatever is going on over the horizon or in our own backyard, we cling to him throughout this desolate journey of life, whether we're in sadness or joy, prosperous or whether we are poor, living in the joy of life or suffering war and persecution. Jesus is our joy and treasure, the one thing needful, our life and our salvation. So we gather at this altar to hear the voice of prophets today, pastors, who preach God's unchanging word to us, whether they be new or old, energetic or running on empty. When we are convicted of our sins, we repent joyfully, for our entire life is a life of repentance as the redeemed children of God. We're not stuck in sin's crisis. In fact, sin can't stick to us. The old Adam in us, by daily contrition and repentance, drowned and dies with all sins and evil desires, and a new man daily emerges and arises to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. This is who we are, people for whom the crisis of damnation is averted. We pray that the crisis of war in Ukraine be averted, the carnage ended, but there is none like the crisis of sin and death. In 1962, nuclear war was averted by American resolve, but the crisis for your soul and mine was averted by Jesus' death and resurrection alone. Yes, even death will be swallowed up in victory on the last great day. If you know of someone who has not heard of, does not understand this good news, then shout it from the rooftops, all clear, crisis, crisis averted. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through true faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all the people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, as once you warned your people to mend their ways and their deeds and heed the voice of your word, so grant us grace that we mend our sinful ways, repent of all the things we have done wrong, and heed the voice of your word. Bring us to the obedience of faith that we may enjoy your mercy and tender compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide and prosper our nation in paths of goodness and virtue. Bless our president, governor, and all elected and appointed government officials that we may be free to worship you in spirit and truth and live as godly citizens while on earth. Deliver us from stubbornness of heart and willful desire that we may learn in all humility and patience 
and share with others the gospel of the cross. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Show your compassion to all who cry to you for mercy and who bear any afflictions of body and soul. Especially we name now Lisa Stonehawker, Bob's daughter who is hospitalized, having difficulty with uh, and diagnosed with uh, MS. We pray for Scout Dehart, recovering at home, Keisha Duncan, Marcy Clark, Gracie and Tierra uh, Rowe, Gracie especially after her surgery uh, to remove her gallbladder. Uh, we ask that you will uh, continue that healing and, and give her restoration, Lord. Pray for Dorothea Thorson, Willie Mae Gurkin, Janelle Goulet, Reverend Dave Heitner of Good Shepherd Duncan, Delita, Millie Rabine's niece with cancer, Elliot Stratton, Harold Moling, Bob Walden, Karen Collins, and we lift up Dr. Jerome Ursulin at McAllister. Grant them healing in accordance with your will and patience until your deliverance comes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend ourselves and all for whom we pray into your care, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we pray that prayer which he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.